come from different backgrounds and walks of life. The one thing that brings us together is knowing that God is alive and that He loves us. At Faith Pleases God, we want to help build your relationship with God, bring your family closer, and raise your children to become tomorrow's leaders. Listen to today's program and hear how God can make a change in you. Hallelujah. Come on, just start praying in the Holy Ghost. Start praying in the Holy Ghost. Lift those voices up just a little louder there. Come on now. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We thank you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We thank you that you have given us the gift of the Holy Ghost. You've poured it upon our lives and that every person, every person, every man, woman, and child can receive and let them know they can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Father, we just give you praise for you in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's go ahead and get into the Word. You got your Bibles with you? Praise the Lord. You know what? Let's turn over to Deuteronomy. That's right, Deuteronomy. I want to show you something. No, not 28. It's so funny. I, I love you all that sit in the front row. You whisper at me. I know what you're going to preach. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 7. Glory to God. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Praise the Lord. A couple of things here I want you to grab a hold of. Deuteronomy, first let's read chapter 623, which really should be basically the same opening of the Bible. Deuteronomy 623 says, Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us a land of which he swore to our fathers. Now look at 7 verse 12. Then it shall come to pass, when it says, Then it shall, then, which is when you receive what God has for you, then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you with the covenant, and the mercies which he swore to your fathers. Listen to this. There are seven increases and multiplications that come into your life. When you finally begin to walk in what God wants you to walk in. Did you hear what I said? There are seven increases and multiplications that will come to pass when you walk in what God wants you to walk in. Listen to this. Verse 13. It says, And He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of, number one, your womb. He's going to bless the fruit of your womb. That's your children. When you begin to do what, listen, when you begin to do what God's telling you to do. See, when you do what God's telling you to do, that's when you enter into the promised land. Several days ago, we spoke a little bit about, uh, when was it? I think it was Sunday. I think it was Sunday morning. We were talking about grasshoppers. That they, they went into the, they went up, the, the Israelites went up to the, to the entrance of the promised land. And the Bible declares that they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And so if they would only have done what God had already commanded them to do, which was just to go possess the land, they were going to receive these blessings. Instead, they chose to have to wait 40 years to receive what God has for them. I want to tell you something right now. God has a plan for your life. You've got a choice whether you want to receive it now or you want to receive it 40 years from now. Regardless, you're, you're going to receive what God has for you. Hallelujah. But it's your choice whether you want it now or whether you want it 40 years from now. If you want to wait 40 years, that's fine, but I want it now. Because once I get it now, then I know tomorrow there's some more blessings. Glory to God. Now look right here, 13, it says it'll multiply you. He will bless, number one, the fruit of your womb, which is your children. And the fruit of your land, which is your work or your income. See, they had to work the land. Your grain, which is your provision or your bills. Can you imagine God blessing your bills? I mean, every time you see your bills, you curse them. These blankety-blank companies again, they keep saying, I thought I'd been making payments about the same size, and you get all mad at them. But God will actually bless your bills. Listen, bless means make more of, multiply. He's going to make more of the provision for you. Amen? It's right there. He's going to make more of the grain offering, the grain, the grain in your gates, the provision. And your new wine, which is your salvation. That means your salvation will increase when you start doing what God tells you to do. And your oil, your anointing will increase when you start doing what God tells you to do. 
and the offspring of your flock, which is your character. See, some people don't realize the offspring of the flock is the character. For instance, Juan and I were speaking in the in my office just a little while ago, and uh, uh, Javier was with us, and Javier was making claims to one of Juan's children, and Juan started saying, yeah, it all depends how many horses you've got. We'll decide whether or not you get... I said, forget horses, man. Start going for limousines. You know, that's a car dealer right there. He just... He said, that's right, a couple of excursions, you know, praise the Lord. He was making deals on your daughter, you bet. Would you believe that? <laughs> you see, back then when they used to do horse trading, the reason why the man would say, you know, well, you know, a couple of camels and, you know, land and sheep and everything. If you want my daughter, they had to pay what's called a dowry. The dowry spoke of their character, what type of person they were. Amen? So when it says the offspring of your flock, he's talking about what kind of character you are. If you look at the book of Job, start, it, and start reading at the book of Job, it begins to express who Job was. He was a man that owned 15,000 donkeys and 10,000 sheep and, I don't know, 11,000 camels. I mean, he had more animals than the zoo. I mean, he had so many animals. That was his character. That was his nature. That was the development of who he is. He says, in the land in which you short went, in which... He swore to your fathers to give you. Watch this. You shall be blessed above all above all people. There shall not be room. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from all from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them upon those who hate you. Come on, look at verse fifteen again. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness. All sickness. You see, when you're doing what God tells you to do, and you ever find yourself with a pain or something inside your body, you need to go back to the Word and remind your body, Hey, you're doing what God's saying to do, so you better be healed in Jesus' name. Somebody said, talk to my body. Well, yeah, your body talks to you. Body's telling you you're sick. You can't do that. When you get old and you try to pick something up, your back goes like, oh, you can't do that. No, your body's talking to you. So while your body's talking to you, you better start talking back to your body. Call it. You liar. You can do this. You know you can. Man, when you grab a hold of this understanding, you'll be surprised some of the things you'll be able to do. Glory to God. You wake up in the morning, all that snap, crackle, and pop that you feel going on before you get to the cereal. You start talking to your body and command those joints to be lubricated in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, that's the way you, you have a good time living. I've never intended for you to be sick. This body was created to self, to self grow, to self heal. Did you know that? Let's look at these again. Verse 13. Let's look at the seven different blessings here. Watch this. He will also bless the fruit of your room, your children, fruit of your land, your work, your grain, your provision, your new wine, your salvation, your oil, your anointing, the increase of your cattle, your character, the offspring of your flock, your descendants, and the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine living as a tribe that is blessed above all people? See, he wasn't speaking specifically as an individual. He was speaking specifically as a tribe. The tribe he was talking to was the Israelites, that they will be blessed above all people. Today we receive that as the believer shall be blessed above all people. If you ever see, and Psalm speaks of this, if you ever see the world prospering, the Bible says don't get angry in your way seeing how the world prospers. You need to recognize that you're a child of God and it's coming your way. Whenever you see something that you so desire, health inside your body, joy inside your life, whatever it may be, know that God has already laid up provision for you. Provision to receive that which you so desire inside your life. Amen? So all you have to do is just really receive it. It's as simple as that. Say, I receive it. Say, I receive it. So that's all it is. Just receive it. And then yesterday we learned about walking like you receive. Amen? You got to know how to walk. Somebody say walk. Walk like you receive. You act like you got it. Praise the Lord. I remember going to college. And I was studying to be an engineer. Television engineer. Everybody asked me, well, so what are you going to do? I'm a TV engineer. What are you going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to repair transmitters. I'm going to build transmitters, invent things. I started speaking that way. 
Because that's the direction I was going. And, you know, you talk to some of the college students today, those that are in universities, they, they think they know it all. Why? Because they've, they've learned what it is to know that they're increasing in knowledge. So therefore, they're living like they're increasing in knowledge. Even though they may not know diddly squat, you know. But you just hang in there. I mean, if you're in college, you'll end up getting the education. Amen? If I hire you for a job, I don't want you walking in there telling me you don't know what you're doing. You better start pretending. Amen? You got to pretend like you know exactly what you're doing. Praise the Lord. Every job I've ever had, I walked into that place like I owned the place. <laughs> and that's how I got a lot of blessings. I remember I got this job in Dallas where I, they had help wanted on there. And I took the sign down, walked in there, said, you don't need anybody else, just me. I'm the man that'll do this job. I thought I was going to do some construction or something because they were building the place. They said, when are you ready to work? I said, I'm ready to work right now. I'll just start right now. I already started. I mean, I, it was work taking the sign down. You know, that's what I was thinking. And so she, he said, the, the, the man said, uh, well, you ready to start? I said, I'm going to start right now. Punch the clock, whatever it takes. I'm ready to go. And he says, okay. Got all the paperwork filled out and everything. And he says, okay, your first job is you got to put that sign back on the wall. I need about 15, 20 more of you guys. So, I said, oh, okay. And so I did it. And I went in there ready to start doing construction. And he says, no, put, the, put that stuff down. I was picking up all the junk, you know, because they were still building the place out. It was going to be a, like a Michael's, you know. They said, no, we don't want you there. We want you to come over here and do framing. You, don't you know how to do framing? I said, yes. <laughs> I can do it. I can do anything. You just show me where the tools are at, you know. I may lose a couple of nails or something, but I knew I'd figure it out, you know. And so they put me through training, and I started doing the mats. And I used to tell everybody I was the best framer. And I made the best pieces of artwork with framing and everything. And you know, and God really blessed me, even though I was in the world. God still blessed me because I understood the understanding of walking like you've received. Amen? Say, I need to walk like I receive. Come on, say it again. I need to walk like I receive. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let me give you an opportunity to plant some seed into the ministry. Let me pray for you right now. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity that you've had for us to come together and learn your word. I thank you that, you know, this is really just a prelude up to the word. We know that any, any second now you're about to explode with more understanding of who we are in you. Now, Father, I thank you that right now as we pick up our offerings, I thank you that you bless your people as they put inside the ministry. And that they return, that it be returned back onto them, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We just receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, please get next to somebody who does have a Bible so you can see this word. I want you to know what it is to, to walk inside this body that we call the body of Christ or the body of the anointing. Listen to what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through verse 20. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? The son of man am? Or who, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Father, I just pray right now an anointing upon this word. That every single person within the sound of my voice will receive it and understand it to be a light inside their lives. Set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Two questions were asked here, verse 13 and verse 15. The first question was asked, says, who do they, the world, say that Jesus, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, the Son of Man? Let me ask you that question. Who is Jesus, the Son of Man, in your life? The second question was asked, he says, who do you, the disciples, say that I am? Listen, before you can recognize, if you're part of this body called Christ, Christ means anointing. The word Christ comes from the Greek word krios, which means to be smeared with oil, to be smeared with an anointing, to be lubricated from God. Amen? Eh. So whenever, it, whenever he says Jesus Christ, see, Jesus' last name was not Christ. If you wanted to know what his last name was, you'd say Jesus of Nazareth. That's the way they would distinguish themselves. But no, Jesus' last name was not Christ, but Jesus' call was Christ. He was the anointed one. Amen? So here he says also that you can become anointed too. He says, who do, who do people say that I am? Who does the world say that I am? Let me ask you a question. Who do you say Jesus is? Before I ever decide whether, you know, when I, when I meet somebody, whether I, I know they're believers or not, is I find out by asking them, who is Jesus to you? I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, can I pray for you? And I say, well, let me ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? That's the first thing I ask. And I don't just want anybody praying for me, and I pray that you're the same way, that you just don't ask anybody to pray for you. Because listen, if the person is praying for you, and if they don't have their, you know, their, really their uh, ducks in a row, you know, or they, <laughs> I mean, you know, who knows what they're going to be praying for, you know. you got to make sure that, that they know who Christ is. So I ask them, who's Christ to you? Sometimes they tell me, well, well, Christ is the Son of the living God who died and rose again, you know, sits on the right-hand side of the Father. Well, even the devil knows that. As though those are just facts. I ask, who is Christ to you? The answer is, he's my Lord and my Savior. He's the one who came down and died on the cross for me that I may be saved. He's the one that called me into righteousness. Glory to God. Amen? So who is Christ to you? <laughs> I remember I asked this one guy, I said, who's Jesus to you? And he said, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He set me free, turned me on, turned me around. I mean, he just started screaming this thing. I said, all right already, I got it. Pray for me already. Pray for me. So Jesus was really puzzled by two questions. He says, who does the world say that I am? And then he asked him, who do you say that I am? He wanted to make sure that the disciples understood who Jesus was. You know, notice the importance to Jesus on what was said about him. Jesus was concerned about his reputation. Let me ask you a question. Are you concerned about your reputation? See, if you had a real concern for your reputation, you'd make sure that whatever you did was righteous. Amen? You wouldn't be involved in anything that was ungodly. Amen? You would keep yourself away from the appearance of ungodliness. Amen? 
So if you have a real conviction about who Jesus Christ is inside your life, you need to have a real conviction about living holy. Glory to God. So notice what he says right here, verse 18. Watch this. Or let's look at verse 17. Jesus answered and said unto them, after they had said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven. You see, what reveals a real revelation of who Jesus Christ is in your life is your Father, your Heavenly Father, who is in heaven. Amen? But now look at 18. It says, And also, and I also say to you, that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, or this foundation, I'll build my church. Now, a lot of people have used the scripture to say, well, that's, you know, the church was built upon Peter. No. He's saying upon the rock of the understanding of who Jesus is. On the foundation, the understanding foundation of who Jesus is. That's where the church is going to be built from. Because he said right here, and I also say to you that you are Peter. I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, not on Peter, but on this rock, the revelation, the foundation that Jesus Christ is Son of the living God. I will build my church. Watch this. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it or be victorious against it. Let me tell you something. I hear people say, saying, you know what the devil does? You know, he, you know, the devil, you know, sometimes he comes as an angel of light or, you know, the devil gets you down. The devil's attacking me and, the devil's doing this, and we find ourselves sometimes that we're preaching the gospel of the devil. <laughs> but when it says right here, it says, Upon the foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, upon the understanding of who He is, He says, My church shall be built upon that foundation. And it says, Upon that foundation, upon that church that I am building, He says, The gates of hell will not be victorious over it. Prevailing is pressing forward. The gates of hell. Hell will not conquer the church. Let me tell you. He was not making an opinion. It wasn't just a promise too, but that's a good point. He was commanding. Oh, you didn't get that. He said, let me, let me, let me show you some commands. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, let there be light. What happened? I mean, light became why? Because he commanded it. Commanded it. Let there be light. I believe in the Big Bang Theory. Suddenly, <laughs> light showed up. You know? <laughs> Wherever God is, there's always a bang. Remember that bang in your life? When he showed up, kaboom. It messed you up, didn't he? Glory to God. I praise the Lord for that kind of messing up. Mess me up some more, Jesus. Now, so he says, he makes a command. Remember, Jesus was there at the beginning. Let there be light. So now he makes another command. This is the command. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is a command. The gates of hell will not be victorious over the church. Hallelujah. Watch this. The gates of hell. Let's look at the gates of hell. Write this down. Number one. Sickness. Hey man, that comes right from hell. <laughs> you know, diseases, colds, pains in the body, all that falls under sickness. Those things come from gates of hell. Well, if sickness comes your way, you need to stand up and say, no, 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 no. Not in this house. I ain't going to accept it in this house. My Jesus declared that you cannot prevail over me because I am part of the church. Praise the Lord. Number two, fear. There's another gate of hell. Anxieties and phobias and insecurities. Oh my. Unhappiness. Number three, unhappiness. Which is lack of joy. I'll tell you something. That is probably one of the biggest ones that affects people that, that we allow the gates of hell to come into our life is in the area of unhappiness, no joy. And even when joy comes, we don't want it because we're so miserable. We don't want to be full of joy. Number four, sin. I mean, the passions that weigh us down. Just the very passions. 
It's the gate of hell. Number five, poverty. You know, lack and, and uh, someone who steals from you, a spirit of stealing. Is, all those are gates of hell. Now, the Bible declares that Satan steals, kills, and destroys, right? The Bible also declares that Jesus gives life and more abundantly. Amen? So Jesus is the one that gives life to the very building or body of the church. Now, the awesome thing about Jesus is that not only does he command, but then he says, I'm going to give you the power that whenever... See, because... Let me back up here. You know, Satan... Satan is disobedient, was disobedient to begin with, right? So, so you know, he made a commandment, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He was talking to the gates of hell. He says, you shall not prevail against the church. But we got to understand that the devil does get disobedient sometimes, and he decides, I'm going to try to prevail. Right? So Jesus wanted to make sure that the gates of hell... That there was a guarantee that the church was going to be protected from the gates of hell. And so therefore he turns around and, and says this, verse 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. See, the kingdom of heaven, you have to look at the kingdom of heaven as being the, the life blood of the body of Christ. It's the power and the authority of the body. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. And so he says, here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? Lock up and don't let the gates of hell prevail over you. You have the keys to decide whether you want to receive it or whether you don't want to receive it. Whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Why? Because you've got the keys to decide what you want released inside the body of Christ. Mm, come on now. Come on now. Now. When fear comes your way, you just bra grab those keys, which is the Word of God. Lock that door up and say, I don't receive this in Jesus' name. Get out of my house. I mean, come on. If someone breaks inside your house, I mean, you're going to sit there and just call the cops? No, I, I li I'd probably be just like a woman. I like the way women... See, men, they want to get a bat and beat the guy upside the... You guys probably got a bigger bat than you or a gun or something. I want to be like a woman. Someone breaks in the house. Ah! Scare the daylights out of that burglar. You just got some man running around. Ah! I want to make a lot of noise. That's right. <laughs> I dare you all to try it. Someone comes against you somehow and puts a gun up in front of you. Ah! You'd scare the daylights out of go, oh my God. I make a lot of noise. Yeah, women know how to handle themselves. You know, us men need to really learn from them. Praise the Lord. So you got to make a lot of noise. And that's what gets the devil out of your house. You start making a lot of noise in Jesus' name. Command you to leave. You have no authority in this place. I got the keys. I got the word. I'm applying it right now. Sickness and disease. You got to go. Open up those keys. Juan, go to my briefcase quickly. Run over there and go bring me my briefcase. Juan's going to lose some weight while I'm here, by the way. I mean, I've been making him run. Come on, run, Juan. Don't stop. Keep going. Acts 2.38. That's right. Yeah. You remember that one, Acts 2.38? Y'all weren't here. I ain't telling you again. I don't like repeating myself. I said I don't like repeating myself. See, you don't, you don't use the keys. You can never get in or out. Right? The keys will lock things up or loose. It'll bind things up or loose things up. Amen? So he tells us, yeah, he tells us. He says, yeah, the gates of hell should not prevail. Why? Because he's given us the keys that we can go and we take the word and see the whole scriptures that you have are all the keys. But you know, you know, the right key. Come on, Juan, hurry. <laughs> Acts 2.38. I don't want to say Acts 2.38 because it'll freeze on me. Praise the Lord, don't go too far. <laughs> well, hang on, I want to get something out of here. I got to show you all this thing. I, I've been driving around my mama's car. My mama doesn't drive around very much. No, it's automatic. Yeah, man, it's awesome. It's loaded. Look at all the ladies. Ooh. She drives one of those new Volkswagen Bugs. This is the key to the car. Watch this. Ah! Ah! <laughs> 
I asked her, I said, Mama, can I go cruising in your car? She's got one of those new Volkswagen bugs, you know. I said, hey, I want to take that thing for a drive. She, she goes, there's the key. And I grabbed the key and I'm going, where's the key? I, I figured out how to open and lo open the, open the doors and lock the doors and open the trunk, you know, but, and that thing came out and I about did what he did, you know. <laughs> you see, the problem is, is that I didn't know how to operate the key. And, 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 and when I, if I try to operate the, operate the car without the key, I ain't going to get it. So I, I said, Mama, how do you, how do you get into this thing? She showed me that button. I said, whoa, wow. Now I just like to do that. <laughs> now, you know, you, you, some of y'all have wads of keys, right? <laughs> right? Y'all got wads of keys. Come on now. You just have two keys? That's pretty good. Some, I know some people, they got some keys. They like, they like showing their keys off. They go all the way down to their knee. <laughs> And then, they, then they're up there on choir, you know, and they're singing, and you think there's tambourines going. It's their keys. You want to go, ching, 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 ching. Now, you know what happens when you grab the wrong key and try to get into the door? You see, you got to know which keys to use. You see, and if you never get inside the Word, you won't ever know what keys to use. See, that's the purpose of this revival that we've been having the past two weeks, is that I've been giving you just a bunch of keys that you can use, just a bunch of stuff you can use. And for those of you guys that missed the revival, we got tapes in the back, and we're getting them all together for you. You just got to let Esther know about it, and she'll give you the whole, what is it, ten messages or whatever that we'll have by the time I'm done here, and you can use keys for just about anything you want. Amen? So it says right here, he says, look, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, Oh, Jesus, bind this right now in my life. Jesus said, you do it. I already did my job. I don't know why people want to dethrone Jesus. Oh, Father, step down off your most holy throne and touch my forehead. Heal my body. Then you come to me, Pastor, I've been praying. I just haven't received anything. You keep talking because you're not using the right key. You're trying to get into the house with the doghouse key. It ain't going to work. It's not going to work. So you got to really know what it is to get inside the, the word. Look, there's two laws of the church. Number one, the gates of hell will not prevail. And number two, we have the keys to the kingdom. Amen? Those are the two basic laws of the church. If there's a command that the gates of hell cannot prevail. And there's also, look, there's also a command that you have the keys of the kingdom. Amen? But now watch this. Look at Matthew 16, the same same verse. Verse 24, but watch this. Look what he says right here. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what a man profit, for what is a man's profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Well, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and, and then he will reward each according to his works. So what we find here in verse 24, it says, Look, if anyone desires to come after me, you want to search after me, you want to be one of the anointed ones, it says right here, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross. we got to know what it is to take up our cross. You know what the cross is? The cross was a representation of the day you died. Let's kind of go in that vein just for a moment. Everything you do is based upon the day you die. Did you know that? The cars you drive are based upon the days you die. The job you take is based upon the days you die. The, the, the career you choose to take is based upon the day you die. If you were going to live 400 years, I promise you, you probably wouldn't be doing what you're doing right now. See, because teenagers are perfect examples of this because teenagers, they have... You know, they, they, it's already been proven. They think with a different part of their mind. How many teenagers do we have here today? Let me see your hand. How old are you? 21? You're not a teenager, brother. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's right. In heart, you know, but you... How about you? Huh? You're 19? Did you know you think with the wrong part of your brain? You see? They don't understand it. I, I used to be the same way. <laughs> no, it has been proven. Watch this. That teenagers, they think with the side lobes of their mind, which is not bad because that gives them invincibility. That's what the side lobes are. And see, the government knows this. This is why in World War II, they, they started decreasing the age limit of, of those that were, they were uh, between World War II and Vietnam. 
uh, of uh, what do you call it? Um, drafting. They, they, they decrease the age limit because they realize the younger they are, the more invincible they think they are. So they know that they throw them inside the, the war and, you know, they, they yeah, G.I. Joe, jump over some stuff and but put a sharp, sharp object in their hand and a heavy weapon. They'll, they'll go nuts. Win some wars for us. A bunch of 22 year olds are sitting in the foxhole thinking with their right mind, going, hey, go going over there. You go over there. So that's why they did that. They really did. I mean, it's, it's been proven. And see, this, 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 the side lobes gives you invincibility. You can do anything, right? But then something happens as, as you begin to age, or we call it maturity, but really as you begin to age, as you get older. <laughs> suddenly, literally, it's like from one day to the next, and science has already proven this, there, a click takes place and suddenly your thinking process goes from the side minds to the front and the back part of your minds, which gives you reason. See, when, you're, when I was a little kid, when I was growing up, I didn't have no reason. You don't think nothing about the future. You do things you shouldn't have done. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it's not like you, from 19 to 20 suddenly this happens. For some of us, it may happen when you're 15 or 16, you know. I mean, really, others, it's like 35, 36. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, my brother, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Taking shots, man. Where is he? I'll take him right now. <laughs> I remember I was, I was what, 23 when it happened, when it, I was a late bloomer, you know. I didn't say big bloomers, I said late bloomers. Uh, I just, I don't know, 23, 24, I used to ride this motorcycle and, and I um, was married for about three years or so and loved riding the motorcycle. I rode it around everywhere. I was in Kansas, you know, rain, sleet, snow, brrr, you know, side mine, I could do anything. Brrr. You know, I always thought, car jumped in front of me, man, I'd hit that car, I'd land on my feet, do a couple of flips, you know. Do a whoa, you know, and then land on my feet. I'd be okay. Because that's, you know, side mind, side mind. So anyway, I'm riding my motorcycle, and suddenly it hit me. It's like something. I'm just driving. It's uh, I remember it was like 1130 in the evening, hardly anybody on the road. I'm in Kansas, you know, nice chilly weather, beautiful time to ride the bike, and I'm riding my bike. And suddenly this thing snaps in my brain. What are you doing? You have a, a, an 18-month daughter. You're married, beautiful wife. God's blessing you, and you're on this bike. You got no helmet on. There's no helmet law. Car jumps in front of you, going 45 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour. What are you? I slammed on the brakes. I'm going 15, 20 miles an hour. And I went all the way to the TV station like this, paranoid that something was going to come jump. This suddenly, this I, I remember it just clicked, and I started reasoning. I was thinking squirrels were going to jump in front of me. I'm on, and I was just, you know, just hanging on for dear life. Man, I couldn't wait till I got back to the apartment. And when I got back to the apartment, man, I, I put that bike, I turned the key off, and I never got on it again. I gave the bike away. This, this 45-year-old that was still side-minded, you know, just, I said, take it, take it, it's yours. He was so side-minded, it was my Uncle Augie, he was so side-minded, he took the bike apart and threw it in the trunk of his car. No reasoning whatsoever, you know. So we got to get our thinking right when it comes to the things of God. Amen? Amen? I think that's where I was going. I don't know, but I had so much fun with it. Oh, yeah, I was talking about how to use the keys, you know. <laughs> how to use your mind. You see, your mind can obtain so many different things. Your spirit man can obtain so many different things. But we got to know where to store these things inside our mind or in the mind of our spirit man. Amen? Amen. That whenever the enemy comes or the gates of hell, because the gates of hell try to prevail. When the gates of hell tries to prevail, you got to pull out the right key. And go in there and attack and say, you ain't coming in here. You lying devil. That's my, that's my famous, famous phrase and I give you all full copyrights to use. When the enemy comes against you, you just call him a lying devil. You gotta put him back in his place. You're a lying devil. Sometimes it shows up in an adult. The devil does. You, you lying devil. Say it to them sometimes. Gotta do it. Another, you get their attention. Call me a devil? No, no. The one that made you say what you just said. That's what I'm talking to. <laughs> Listen to this, where it says, Lord says, let him deny himself, verse 24. Take up his cross and follow me. Take up the point of death. Take up the day. Listen, take up the day that you think you're going to die. This is where I was going now, remember. <laughs> See, those lobes, I'm still working, you know. Look. Everything that you do, everything you do is based upon how long you think you're going to live. 
Did you all realize that? How many of you all realize that? Let me see your hand. I mean, as the years go by, you begin to say, oh, wait a minute. I got maybe another 20 years of business. So, man, I better, I need some raises. I need this. I need, oh, man, I better start eating some oatmeal, you know, and cream of wheat. You know, I, you start changing your diet. You start changing your clothes. You start changing where you shop. You start changing who you hang out with, what you drink in your body, based upon what? Based upon how long you think you're going to live. Well, Jesus says, quit thinking about your own life. Take up your cross, your point of death, and follow me. Listen, when you take up your cross or your point of death and you follow Jesus, now your life is in his hands. Oh, come on now. That's right. It's in his hands. And don't you know, he'll take care of you. Amen? He will know. And how many of you all know he knows how to take care of you? Hallelujah. See, you haven't lived until you lived in him. You don't know what living is until you live inside him. Go to Acts chapter 5. Let's kind of look right now what it is to be living inside the, the life of the church. Now that we know the church has some kind of authority here. Acts chapter 5. Watch this. Let me show you something. Is this good stuff? Uh, listen. Acts 5 verse 12 through 16. Watch this. This is the very first church. This was after they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. The power of God was moving. And the disciples were still here. Now they were apostles. Watch what happens right here. It says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the church, or added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by passing by might fall on them on some of them also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed when we begin to realize what the function of the church is the world themselves will come to us for for deliverance Right now you tell people about Jesus and they don't want to know nothing about it. Why? Have you ever wondered why they don't want to know nothing about it? Because they're not seeing, no, they're not seeing no real power in you. They're not seeing no real power. Where'd the power go? Well, you haven't applied the power. The life force of the kingdom of God. The life force of the body of Christ. The Bible here declares, declares that many signs and wonders. Everybody say that with me. Signs and wonders. See, many signs and wonders were done how? By the hands of the apostles. Do you see it there? Signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's part. You see, we need to know that we have a power to go deliver people. You have the keys of how people, are, how people can receive their deliverance. Someone comes to you and needs healing. You need to open up that key of healing by his stripes. You're made healed. Amen. You were healed. Amen. Shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You just pull those keys out. Someone comes to me. Look, someone comes to me and they need some healing. I'm not going to talk to them about, uh, you know, feeding their sheep. I'm going to show them scriptures about healing. People who come to me that are poor, I'm not going to talk to them about receiving healing. I'm going to talk about them receiving prosperity through the word. So I'm going to pull out the right key and fix their problem. Amen. And so here... Many signs and wonders were, were done by the hands of the apostle. That wherever they went, that not only, not only were signs and wonders happening, but what happened, they went out and people started bringing bodies to them. Can you imagine people going to you? Ambulance. You hear a siren. Wee, 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 wee. And you look outside the window and you think somebody next door neighbor is going to get picked up. Instead, they drop a body off in your front yard and say, Michael Tejas, will you please lay hands on my wife? She needs a little... I'm telling you, we need to, we need to bring it to modern, modern day. Hallelujah. This thing, this thing will happen inside your life when you begin to move out in signs and wonders. I was holding a, 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 a crusade over in, uh, in South San High School in uh, San Antonio. You're going to like this. And uh, it was awesome. Had I don't know how many people were there, but I started, just started praying for people. I just felt moved just to... I saw some people that were sick, and I saw this lady, she kept grabbing her belly, and in the middle of my preaching, I just said, woman, come here, and I laid hands on her, power of God hit her, she fell out, got up, rejoiced in her belly, just completely healed, and so all these people just started receiving their healing, I started calling people out, and so other people came up to me and said they had this problem, that problem, 
And, you know, church was pretty well over. I was just having fun now, just rejoicing with the testimonies. And here comes this couple, comes walking up to the front of the stage. And I saw them, and the, the, the woman was holding this, this little baby girl, uh, probably couldn't have weighed more than uh, maybe 15 pounds, 20 pounds. She was a four-year-old, very tiny and very thin. And she was holding the baby up like this on her, on her, on her arms. And when I looked like that, I, I could see there was one knee that was about, about the size of a, a grapefruit. The other knee was smaller, but there was one knee that was large. And so I just looked like that, and I said, well, you know, what would you need? She said, well, I want prayer for my daughter. So I just prayed for the daughter. I saw the knee. I commanded the knee, the swelling to go down. I thought maybe she sprung her knee or something like that. As I was praying for the little girl, suddenly the, the, the woman began to quiver, and she fell out. I mean, just fell out in the Holy Ghost, and the, the little girl landed on her, on her feet. Now, the father was, was kind of like a step or so behind and to the left a, a, a little bit. And he saw the little girl hit the floor and take off running. And he saw the mama just fall out like that. And he just started crying. And he went up to me and he says, can you, can, and it's all he said, can you? And I knew what he wanted. He pointed at his wife and I went ahead and laid hands on him. And he fell out in the Holy Ghost. Now, now that just kind of seems like a basic, you know, pretty much testimony that we've seen. But after the, the service was pretty much over, they came up and, they, and also the following Sunday and they testified. What had happened, first of all, is that these two never knew Jesus. They never knew what power was. They've never seen a miracle before. They've, they didn't even know that you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Had no idea about what God can really do for them. They just saw the power over there. So they just thought, well, maybe he can pray and bless my, 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 my daughter. I mean, they'd never seen the inside of a church. And so when I laid hands on that little girl, the mama just felt, she said, I don't know what it was. I felt like my knees had buckled and someone was shaking me and I fell down on the floor. And then the, then the, the father said, yeah, and when my, and when my daughter hit the floor on her feet and took off running, she has never run her entire life. He saw that, the, the little girl running, he was so blessed, he knew something had happened. And so he just wanted, he was gonna say, please pray for me like you prayed for her. And so I didn't let her, I didn't let him get that far, and he was having a hard time saying it anyway, so I laid hands on him and hit the floor. Now while he's, while they're testifying at the church the following Sunday, this little girl is running all over the church, up and down the church, up and down the church. And then the woman, the, the little girl sees me, comes running around like that, and she just kind of lodged herself on my left thigh. And I just thought it was the cutest thing. And, the, and in, with tears in their eyes, the father starts telling me, he says, Pastor, we, our daughter has never walked. One leg was two and a half inches shorter than the other. A little girl this big, she was that big to begin with. Imagine having two and a half inches shorter than the other. The doctor said we, in order for her to walk, we had to buy a, a certain a two and a half inch platform shoe, a special shoe that we didn't have the money for. He says, I was so fed up with what was happening inside my family, I went ahead and I left my family. And the only reason why we showed up that day was because I was out washing my own clothes on the laundromat and I saw an advertisement for the revival stuck on one of the cork boards in the laundromat. And so I just knew that I, I, need, I, I, had, I had this picture where I'm like this, you know. <laughs> so he saw the picture, and he took the picture that was saying, you know, go home. That's what he said. It was facing right towards his house. <laughs> so he took the picture. He went over there. And when he got to the house to tell his wife he wanted another try, his wife was at the kitchen table holding also the same advertisement that she got uh, from her mailbox that one of the people had dropped off. And see, they just kind of looked at each other. They broke and cried. They knew that something was happening. They didn't know what it was. Can you see how God can really move things along when the power of God is really displayed and showed? I mean, these testimonies will, will become real inside your life if you begin to move out inside these things. Look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Watch how Jesus puts it here. Verse 15. Jesus says, said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe. Watch this. In my name they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now let me tell you, that there's six things he's telling us here. Number one, he says, preach the gospel. Write that down. Preach the gospel. Number two, make disciples. Number three, cast out devils. Number four, speak with new tongues. Number five, nothing can hurt you. And number six, lay hand on the sick. These are the actual proofs of the ministry. These are proofs of you being part of the body of Christ. 
part of the church. Look, I'm not talking about church membership. I'm talking about you being part of the very body of Christ. Jesus says, the word declares that he's the head. We're his body. Look at, look at John. Watch this. Look at John 15. Because John 15 talks about how the body really looks, in a sense, uh, and shows how it's all, how, how the body distributes things inside it. Look, John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me, or meaning if you're attached to me, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Look at verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of its own unless it abide in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they will be burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Watch this. Read verse 7 again. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Really just out of verse 7 and verse 8. Is really telling you that everything you ask God for is going to come from God, the Father, and is going to glorify God, the Father. So when you lay hands on the sick, when you cast out devils, when you move according to the power that dwells inside you, being the body of Christ, what are you doing? You're offering up glory onto the Father. Now, how many of y'all would like to glorify God? Let me see your hands here. Come on. Hold them both up. Hold them both up. You want to glorify God, don't you? Don't you all, young people over here, you want to glorify God, don't you, ladies? You see, what these very hands that you have resurrected inside the air, those hands, that's where it's at. The, the ability to glorify God. Find somebody who needs a touch of God and lay hands on them. Amen? I, I get people that come into my house, and I just praise the Lord for, especially you, you young ladies that are right there. People that come to my house, and sometimes they come, and they need ministering, and they cry, and whatever, and, you know, they're at the house kind of sharing their problems. My little kids, King Isaac, three years old, Caleb Michael, seven years old, Christian Danielle, 11 years old, sometimes sees these people hurting, and these little, these little kids come walking up to them, laying hands on them, saying, you know, Jesus' name, Jesus' name, putting his hands on them. And these people can be set free just by these little kids doing it on their own. And if we could be like that, if we could be like a little child, you got to be like a little child. That's the way Jesus says it. Unless if you're like a little child, you'll never accept it. The reason being is that when you're an adult, your thinking changes. You need to think like a child. You tell a child, put your hand on the person's forehead, they'll receive their healing. They do it. My three-year-old lays hands on more kids and more people than most preachers. I got a key on my, on my, I got a, a vial of, an, of oil on my, on my keychain. And if, if the boy just glances at the keychain and sees the vial, he wants to go lay hands on somebody. I remember the first time he came up to me, I didn't know what was going on, because we, you know, we were telling him we'd put the oil on his finger and he'd pray. And so one day he came up to me and had the keys, and he went, hey, because he can't talk. I said, what? What? You know, two-year-olds. You got me. What? I'm looking at the keys like, you want to go outside? No! Now what is it? And he's crying. And I said, what is it? I look at Lisa and she goes, look at what he's doing. He was going like this. And he was pointing at the vial. He was saying, pray for me. And he's crying. Pray for me. He was looking at me dead and said, oh, daddy, pray for me. So I took the vial and got some oil on my finger and I went like that in Jesus' name. The moment I put it on his forehead. And he closes his eyes like that, and I put it on side of his forehead, he goes, thank you. And then he goes like that with his finger, so I put it on his finger, and whoever's in the room, bam, bam, bam. That's where bam, bam comes from. Bam, bam. And he prays for people. And I'm telling you something, when that little boy, he's not, he'll be three in March. When he, and that little boy lays hands on people, the power of God moves inside of people's lives. It's wonderful. But this little boy has no idea what he's doing. He just believes it's a way of life. And that's the way we need to see it too. That you are the same as the body of Christ 
And this needs to be a way of life for you. You need to go to the very power that God has given us as being part of the body of Christ as a way of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Faith Pleases God is a full gospel Holy Ghost Revival Family Church. You and your family need to come worship with us. English service times are Sunday at 11 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. Wednesday night service begins at 7.30 p.m. Our Spanish service times are Sunday at 8.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Tuesday night service begins at 7.30 p.m. Let God become real in your family. Worship together with us at Faith Pleases God Church.